Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode six of From Sparks to Skyscrapers. This podcast is all about entrepreneurship and teaching the young generation of innovators. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Steve Ockers, who's an economics professor here at our sinus. Dr. Ockers, I know you went to Indiana University for college, and after graduating, did you have any idea what you wanted to do, uh, or was it just kind of a free-flowing thing uh, where you picked up wherever you felt like? Yeah, it, it's a, listen, that, that's a really good question, because I think the challenge, in fact, I, I talk to my students in class all the time, and, and uh, out of 25 students, uh, it's probably one that'll know what they want to do. Um, and I think it's, it's pretty normal not to know. I, I, I didn't know exactly. I had a sense. Uh, I knew we wanted to lead. I knew we wanted to be CEO, but I couldn't, wasn't quite clear what that looked like. And I think for anyone coming out of college, um, it, that's not unusual because business is such a strange, amorphous, confusing, it's more art than science. And while you can learn some of it in college, you don't quite know what it's really like till you get into it. So I had a general sense of what that was, but but much like you guys, I, I, it, it's almost overwhelming. Yeah. You, you look at it and you go, I don't quite know what this beast is and it has so many elements that make it up. So I sort of knew, but you sort of have to uh, feel your way through it. Looking at your resume, you've had a diverse uh, group of different roles across different fields, um, a lot of executive roles. Right. And I was just wondering what, are some benefits, advantages, or disadvantages that come from young people exploring different sorts of work coming out of college? Well, the interesting thing about that is most of those are opportunistic. Um, and you, you go where you, you, you need to be. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the older you get, the more you look for unique experiences. I think for a young person going in, the thing that's really critical is, is you, you, and I was in this boat too, is that there's things I thought I liked, thought I was good at, these things I didn't know existed or thought I was bad at, and most of that was not true. So you walk into a situation where, hey, I think I love this, and suddenly you go, God, I don't like it, or I'm not good at it, or I'm not efficient at it, and there's things that I thought I wasn't great at that suddenly I go, you know, I guess I'm really talented at this, I didn't even, or I didn't even know it existed as a job. And so the exploration of, of a lot of elements is pretty central to exploring, one, what's out there, two, how do I fit, and wh where's my place in the world? And so I, I'm a strong advocate of just, just do a lot of things, primarily to flush out the things that you think you might like, that you, you want to confirm that, no, it's not the thing. And you want to put yourself in a situation where you may be able to touch on some things that um, suddenly you go, this is it, right? They, they sort of, the, this is it will find you, yeah. right? Of being, of being really patient around having the right thing find you in that process. Because it's almost like if you, if you force it, yeah, it's like chasing your shadow, yeah. right? You can't quite find it, but it, it will always find you if you're kind of patient enough in that situation. I, I'm curious. So where are you from originally? From Chicago. Okay. And yeah. so the, I guess the Midwest thing is how you ended up in Indiana. Indiana was an accident. Really? I, I came out here looking for schools, did the whole tour, the Villanova thing and everything else. And I got a letter from IU and um, I was like, it never dawned on me. I mean, I don't think of Indiana. And we went down there and the minute I walked on campus, me and one of my friends, it, it yeah. was Stunning. It looked like all these coast schools, but it was 20 times the size. Awesome, yeah. And I, I go, this is it. I knew within five minutes. Yeah, that's interesting. I felt the same way actually coming here. Really? Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know what it was. I just walked on campus and I loved it. And just fit. Yeah. So growing up before college, before you thought about college, what did you spend a lot of your time doing? Were you an athlete or... Yeah, more played academic. soccer, um, played a lot of lacrosse, uh, was on the tennis team, um, played a ton of tennis, uh, golfed, all that kind of stuff. And, that, that got, and then I played lacrosse in college and, and there was an athlete all the way through. Yeah, so do you, would you say that that has shaped you at all uh, in the sense that, I mean, you mentioned you wanted to be a, in a leadership role. Right. Um, were you a leader on the teams that you were on? Yeah, accidentally. Um, I, I wasn't the best on the team, uh, to be clear, but I, I probably, I was the biggest and strongest and played the hardest and I was, I was pretty aggressive. And um, the, we, we, at some point, we were a club, uh, but big club, a big 10 mm -hmm. kind of, back in the early eight, mid eighties, I mean, you didn't have many D D1 level teams. Michigan was D1, Ohio State and Penn State were mm -hmm. D1. Um, but the rest of big 10 was trying to get there. There's a process. And we had a coach whose sons went to Syracuse and who are, were very famous. Like they, they started the whole run of national championships. He's our coach. And so they would always be at our practice. At some point, he got transferred. He was older. And um, the, somehow through that process, the team, for some reason, I didn't seek it out, voted me to be the president. And then I ended up being head of club sports. We had 80 teams. 
A um, bunch of those went up to D1 level, and I was part of that process, which is amazing. Uh, like women's soccer, women's yeah. lacrosse, uh, uh, women's... That um, whole revolution. The whole thing was there, so you know, part of that. But then they, they wanted me to be a coach, too. And it's just accidental. I, I think because I put the team, other people before me, <laughs> and I didn't really seek it out. Um, and I took it pretty seriously. And I think that started the whole... And all credit to you, because they, they yeah. had an amazing process where they, they gave us like real leadership opportunities of scale. And, and that really shaped um, how I thought about things. Yeah. And I mean, the theme that I'm noticing here is most of this stuff is just you're capitalizing on opportunities. Accident, They're accidents. Accidental. And, and Never say no to anything. Yeah. And after coming out of college, just two years later, you, you've had your first company that you founded. And before, we talked about this a little bit before. Yeah. That was an accident too, right? So can you just take me through that? Complete. Yeah. So so my wife now, uh, she's my girlfriend at the time. Uh, she was working at a um, consulting firm, health healthcare, and they were a combination consulting firm and law firm, and they would do accreditations for hospitals. And, and then part of what they did, part of the division she was in, is they were recruiting physical therapists from Europe because we had a shortage. Um, we didn't have graduate schools here, and placing them in in hospitals here. Well, they got out of that business. Well, the people called, kept calling her and said, hey, we still want people. And so she, we talked one day, she said, can we do this? I go, sure, why not? And so suddenly we were, had a business accidentally yep. um, of, of rec recruiting these people. And we did all the, the legal paperwork and she placed them in the, the hospitals and that ran for a number of years. And, and uh, while well, it's not a ton of money now, we, at the time, we didn't have any money. I mean, right. it, was, it was a lot for us back then. And so that, that's how that, that emerged. And would you recommend, and you mentioned, you said never say no, right? But right. would you mention, or would you recommend that young entrepreneurs jump right in and try to start that business up? Or would you say it could also be beneficial to maybe get a role, uh, a, like a salary yep. job in the yep. field that you're trying to get into to gain some experience before starting that company? Well, I'll give you a bad answer. Yes and yes. Yeah, right. Right. So, so certainly being young um, is, is usually the best time to jump in, right? I mean, the, the advantage that we have now is with, with technology and you could start a, um, uh, you know, basically a company out of your dorm room with all the, the tech online. It's, it's easy to facilitate that. Um, and pretending what it is, that's the right way to go. Having said that, you also want to be an expert in your field. And depending what industry you're interested in, you're getting your, your resume stamped and actually getting the real-time experience, um, being, being really trained and socialized around whatever it is, is, is essential. And certainly being in a corporate environment gives you skill, a very compressed period of time, gives you sophistication and skill sets, um, best practices, way of thinking, uh, ways of understanding what you don't know, uh, which is critical. And then best practices in terms of, of, uh, of management and, and, and running companies that you can't get elsewhere. I and mean, that, that there is significant pain or there is a disaster trying to figure that out on your own. But if you're in a bigger organization, they, in effect, teach you. When you come out of school, you don't know anything. Yeah. I didn't either, right? So you learn on the fly, and, and that's part of what companies do. They, they train you up. Um, but generally, they throw you in the deep end, and you got to swim, but you have a lot of support around you. So you can bring that to bear on jumping over. What I see a lot of people do is go for a few years, get their feet underneath them, and then jump over to be an entrepreneur on the backside of that. Yeah. What was your first executive level role? Uh, and what drove you to want to be in that kind of a role other than just the financial side of things? Um, the first executive ish was um once again an accident is is um <laughs> well there, there are two things about my head that similar period of time. I was in grad school and grad school is expensive so I had to pay for it. And so they had a assistant ships, graduate assistant ships, but this guy came in who I never, I didn't know who he was, um, but he ended up being the, the um, former director of the National Park Service for the first George Bush in the late 80s. And so he was a pretty big guy, um, really connected, and he, he was starting a research consulting institute at, at IU, and they needed someone. And uh, I wanted to be in a research institute at the time, so I was a little grumpy to go over there. <laughs> but it turns out they needed a second in command, and it was amazing. I mean, I, I had the most amazing experiences with a guy of that scale who, who talked to presidents and, and knew, knew kings and, and governors and senators and, and the work we did was uh, f amazing. I mean, I had to grow up really quick in a compressed period of time, but so you understand the nuances of politics, I mean, individual politics, not big politics, right. uh, was f amazing. And through that process, we did a consulting role and um, we identified uh, something in the local community and, and a nonprofit sprung up. And they, they tapped, they said, do you want to be the CEO? 
and uh, interviewed with the board of directors who were all doctors. It was a, a nonprofit for, for healthcare, and that emerged. And so I was mid 20s, um, and I was a CEO of, of, of a nonprofit healthcare corporation for a number of years, and, and that's kind of where that, where that emerged. After you had a few executive roles, did you ever think about actually branching out and starting a business of your own again, or uh, did you just enjoy that space enough to continue on for an extended yeah, period of time? It's, it's interesting because you kind of bounce a little bit, um, but I ended up getting shepherded into well, the, some, literally the biggest company in the world. I mean, they have a DHL Dr. Post, which no one knows, but it, it literally had 65% of the global market share. 523,000 people, um, you know, $100 billion corporation. I mean, it, it, it would literally be like number two in the world in terms of size of any corporation. So yeah. ended up being an executive there, and I just followed that wave, right? And so I, I got really good at understanding huge global corporation structures and politics, and, and I ran like four divisions there and, and got tapped to, to do a turnaround, um, was part of the strategy group and everything else. So I, I was... In that that mindset, um, that's what I inherently understood, and so I, I I didn't I didn't jump ship. Now we had a lot of entrepreneurial elements within that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, so whether, whether it's data analytics or artificial intelligence stuff or all that that, that stuff emerges in the safety of, of a larger corporation. And so when I think of entrepreneurship, it's not just hey, I'm starting something out of my dorm or my garage like Apple started, right? You, it happens all the time where you, any big corporation will fund innovative entrepreneurial ideas within the walls of, of a huge corporation. The, the beauty of that is you've got tons of resources and a lot of seed funding and you've got, you know, you have a lot of uh, sort of resources to tap to kind of make that work. But you also have the pressure of you better make better perform. Yeah. And you're always using skills that we talk about in the U Imagine Center constantly as far oh, yeah. as problem solving. I mean, day to day, every, I'm sure a role like that has to be extremely second. stressful. Well, I, maybe. I mean, it depends. It depends I, yeah. I, I like the stress, right? So for me, that's yeah. not stressful. It's not necessarily a bad no, thing. No, it's fun, yeah. right? But you, you are you are literally problem solving hundreds of times a day, and and, and the complexity of the matrix situation. Where you've got so many elements going on. You've got to be pretty aware of nimble of, of, of that, and you're always in that that mindset of either understanding the risk, mitigating the risk, understanding the markets, um, uh, driving growth, um, and really fixing all the problems that that might be that are barriers to getting that done. And you're always in that mode. And, and particularly you're in that mode of, how do I get others to help? That may or may not report to me, or may or may not be within my same organizations. And so the influence of getting that facilitated is, is certainly part of the deal as well. And then getting alignment and vision and then navigating that and making sure that we've got all the people within the organization, whether it's a startup or whether it's an existing to uh, focus on the same, the same um, goal is, is, is central. I mean, most of the time you're spending your time with people. Right. right. It, it's aligning people. It's working with and through others and getting that, driving that through. That's probably the biggest challenge and, and the most beauty. And, and that's where the art is. Yeah, the absolutely. And so do you, do you think, was that your most challenging role? Would you no. say? What, what was? If you're, I mean, if you're comfortable talking about it. No, I mean, I, at this point, they don't, none, none of it seems that hard yeah. at this point. But, but certainly, I think, um, for me, challenge was always external. Things I couldn't control. Right, so when I think of challenge within anything we can identify and understand and can control within an organization, that's easy. I mean, even if even if there's a problem, if we, as long as we see it, we can fix it. And you find smart people around you to to facilitate that and get that done. But I think 2008, 2009 through 2012, tough when, period of time when the whole economy crashed and burned, and we had 9/11, which business-wise was a problem, by the way. I mean, that really affected the industry. But then 2008, 9 through 12. We had no idea what was going on. Yeah, nobody. Like here did. with COVID, we know it's COVID, so I, I know what the problem is. Okay, we got to navigate that, but we know then we didn't know what was going on. And on top of it, you had a situation where you had um, um, a transition in technology and globalization that none of us knew was happening, and so you had this convergence that was just brutal. I mean, brutal in a way where no one understood what was going on. And what struck me as profound in that moment was. I, I beat myself up really hard going, okay, I'm a CEO of a, of a big company, uh, many, many millions of dollars, tens of millions, and I'm running it, and my, all my clients are Fortune 50s, and I don't know what to do. And then I realized no one knew what to do. And I go, okay, I'm asking the wrong questions. What I needed to do was, what are the questions, and start working on the questions, and, and start chipping away at what do I see, what do I understand, and through that, the answers emerge. But the biggest challenge there was that mindset shift and then I think on top of it, I don't think my organization, we were really good at what we were doing, my, my staff, my people, 
but where the world was going, that we had to push them hard. And I think that was hard because a lot of the weight of that landed on me to do everything. And that's not a sustainable model. One, I don't have all the answers. And two, you just don't, don't have enough time in the day. And to put all that weight on your shoulders and really put an entire company on your back that's that big is, is not an easy process to sustain, right? So I need to scale that leadership. And that, I think, was the biggest challenge. Do you have a process that you go through as far as problem solving goes? Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily, I mean, obviously, not going to be a super structured thing, maybe, right. but when you are presented with a problem, right. where does your mind immediately go? Um, there is a process. And maybe it, it's, um, one, I have to identify what's going on, right? And understand it and describe it. Um, th th those are critical because you, you can't make decisions without having a fully comprehensive, triangulated understanding of what's actually going on because then you're just going to make mistakes. Two, you have to really, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, you have to slow down to go fast. So really you have to slow things down, slow yourself down, slow your mind down, slow your emotions down, slow the organization down and go, what is really going on here? Um, you got to really focus on the impact. You have to really focus on priorities. The, the biggest challenge I see is, is folks um, brilliantly solving the wrong problem. And, and all the research shows that clearly is what's actually the root cause of what's going on. We need to solve that directly. And then being really focused on um, precision in terms of answering the problem and then uh, comprehensive follow through, right? So for me, that's regardless of what the problem is, it's, it's pretty easy. You go, you walk in, we're going to triangulate, triangulate this really heavily. We're going to really spread. We're going to be comprehensive in spreading our wings, understand from everyone's perspective what's actually going on before we actually act. And then we're going to focus on what are the few trigger levers we can pull that really move things. Now, in my head, I, I really try to simplify, simplify things because I think most people, um, particularly CEOs, complicate things. It's not that hard. It's revenue, expenses. That's it. It's only two levers you have to pull. So those are your two answers. We're doing something with revenue and we're doing something with expenses. And if I can just play those triggers, we're in a really good place. Simplify the answers and simplify the solutions and it tends to work out pretty well. Yeah. So in 2018, you started teaching inner science. What made you decide to move into that space, the teaching space, rather than continue? I mean, obviously you right. still have certain roles, but what drove you to decide to come to our science and teach? Um, well, we're local, right? So I was, um, for 20 years, we've driven by, I live two miles away. So I was like, I'd like to work there one of these days. Um, I was CEO of a company out of the UK. We just had went public. It was a startup, a tech firm um, that had uh, Nestle's and Procter & Gamble's and Nestle Johnson's and stuff as clients and, and um, Unilever's. Um, and my wife got sick. She got cancer. Um, she's okay now, but, 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 that. but that was... Um, it was one of those moments where me not being home, me being in the UK, London all the time, and running around was, was not a, a good thing given what was going on. The second thing that was interesting is the founder was still in the company. Okay. And, and we had um, different views of um, reality. <laughs> I wanted, to focus, I wanted yeah. to focus on revenue, and he wanted to focus on a good story. And I, I, my executives that I hired for the US corporation, we had a, have a separate corporation get that up were really focused on driving revenue. And he was in a very different space. He had never really led before like that. And so I wasn't really thrilled with um, the way that was going, even though I was running the company, didn't have complete control um, in, a, in a reality way. Um, so it's just everything, I, I, I could see 20 steps beyond. I go, I, I know this is going, and this is going to hit an iceberg. And I, you know, between that and Tanya being sick, I said, you know what, it's a it's good time to step away. Step away. Yeah. Right. Sometimes you don't, don't want to push rock uphill all the time. Yeah. Sometimes it's important to recognize when your when your time. Yeah. To step away is and yeah. you know it's an it's everyone's a, it's a skill. Yeah. Everyone's got to be aligned, and when things are not aligned, when I was younger, I think I would just keep pushing that, and at some point where you realize it's not going to go where you think it's going to go, or you can certainly see I can reverse engineer those those steps. I go here's where we're going to be, and if you don't see that clear path and don't get the buy-in you need, um, that I, I go, it's not a good place to be. So you mentioned the different views that you had as far as running that company where it was a story versus revenue. Right. I, I'm curious, having been a, an executive at you know, massive scale companies, what's your opinion on kind of uh, the new landscape of, you know, where nowadays companies need to have morals in a sense of, um, you know, this, this kind of, I guess I'll call it woke culture that we're seeing. Um, 
And I'm curious what your view on that is from the executive level, because a lot of times that view is going to be much different, much more revenue driven than it might be for someone that's maybe my age. You know, it, it's, it's complicated because there's, um, let me preface this, but we're in a really weird world that, that is bifurcated, right? There, there's, there's organizations out there, most, a lot of startups, particularly tech startups, that um, while amazing have done us a disservice because they're not going into business to, to make money or to be a profitable organization. They're going to business to be, to be purchased, mm -hmm. right? So most folks that are starting tech firms have no interest in actually running a good company or running a company. It's about shiny objects and, and um, we want to be shiny so that Microsoft or Apple or Google will, will purchase us, right? So that, that's the one dynamic. The other dynamic is the fact that, that most organizations have to make money, right? You got shareholders, even if they're private or the public, and so th that's not optional. Even, even in nonprofits, you still need to make money, right? Um, to, to do your services. The, the, the challenge is your, your, your stakeholders, right? So you have um, your employees, you've got your shareholders, um, private or public. Then you now have this entire ring that are, is larger than that, that involves um, the publics, the local communities, um, environmental groups. And so balancing that is, is difficult because you need to meet at least a minimum threshold, as I think about it, on, on all of those. You can't um, uh, go into a ditch at yeah. any one of those because then, then you're, you have a real problem. Now, some companies get in trouble through, they become targets for whatever reason, and you can never get out of that. And that becomes a, a real problem. Amazon's would have this problem. Facebook. So Facebook. Certainly, certainly individuals are holding their employee or their, their companies accountable. The one shift I do see that I'm, I'm excited about is it feels like between my generation and your generation is you guys seem to be holding the companies accountable in ways that we did not. We were, hey, we're working. We're glad to have a job. We're scared of losing our gigs and we're not going to push back where you guys are like, hold on. No, 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 no. There need to be some ethics here and some values, whatever those are. And there's pushback. And so I, I like the fact that that dynamic or that uh, power gradient shifting a little bit and the companies now know they need to be re responsible. Um, although some companies legitimately are doing it, Patagonia, right? Yeah. It's clearly in that space where it, it is authentic and legit to who they are as an organization. And everything they do filters down strategically all the way to the products they make and everything in between. And there's other companies that are just doing it because they have to check the box. And they're doing it just to avoid social media uh, blowing nightmares. up on them, yeah. And so they're not doing it because it's authentic to who they are. They're doing it because they just don't want to get in trouble. So that's. But I do think this wave of us holding companies accountable for whatever the Me Too culture stuff. Thank God, right? Yeah, exactly. Th th that alone is a massive shift. Um, Black Lives Matter, and certainly the environmental stuff. Yeah, you guys are going to be in a really good place to say, hold on, this isn't just you giving your job is not enough. Right, like we expect more from our employer, and so I, I see that trend accelerating, and I think that's a really good thing. Yeah. So I kind of want to talk a little bit more about the role as the as a professor now. Okay. And so, what do you see um, in college students today? Uh, we talked about before how you know a lot of students face anxiety about yep. figuring out what they're going to do. They have to have a plan, yeah. right? And I'm included in this group. Yeah, yeah. Like I don't, I, I don't it. exactly know yet. I remember being 18. Yeah, I, I understand and, exactly. And what kind of advice or or uh, words do you have for those students that might not know precisely what they want to do? That they're going to go to med school and become a doctor. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. there's a lot of especially in today's world with social media where you can kind of make your own uh, business right. from your phone. Yeah, yeah. Well, one, I think it's completely normal. And in fact, I, I, I've talked to my students in every class probably two, three times a semester to just see kind of where their heads are, where their emotions are. And, and uh, to, a, to a, a, you know, a person, they're usually, yeah, there's, a, there's anxiety. And, and primarily because they're walking, dipping in the world they know nothing about. Um, and the reality is most of us are walking out with tremendous potential and, and little skill sets, particularly for the business world, right? Um, you learn on the job. Um, is one, it's normal. Two, you know, if you're here and you're paying attention, doing well, you've got the right tools and you've got the right orientation and the right makeup to succeed and be really good. Mm -hmm. um, and three, he's got to relax into it, which is such bad advice. Right? Cause, <laughs> I, but cause everyone, clearly everyone, it's not. I mean, right? Because everyone says, well, I have to do something. So why? It'll find you. Just, yeah. just take your time, explore everything, ease your way into it. Don't freak yourself out. Don't. Try to, to focus on the problem and not the, the, the anxiety because that, that can spiral, right, for all of us, right? You get anxiety over getting a job and what am I going to do? And that makes it worse. Settle into it and see what doors open 
and just start going through the doors. And you can adjust later. I, I think the challenge is, and I, I did this when I was 2022, 20, right? Is, is uh, I felt I had to optimize. I got to get the perfect job in the right situation. I can have it forever. No, right? You get a gig and then you go, okay, is this working? Is this not working? Is this who I am? Is this the right skill set? And you can adjust. You can figure it out as you go. Figure it out as you go. And, and, and you always do. Yep. And the right things somehow magically usually find you. Yeah. Of, the best laid plans. Oh, forget Fail. it. Yeah. I mean, I, I've learned that because the more plans I make, it, it stress, it, me too, stresses me out. I go, well, clearly I can't control external events outside of me. And it never turns out that way. So I've given up. Yeah. I say, I have a general direction. I have an idea we're going to head. Uh, but you have to take the opportunities as they come and go, does this fit my general idea or not? If it does, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And I mean, that's not saying not to work hard. I mean, one of my, no. favorite, one of my favorite sayings is, is luck is when preparation meets right. opportunity. And I think yeah. that's true. I mean, yeah. you have to work very hard and you have you to show up. You have to, exactly. You got to show up. You have the battle. Really you got to show up. That's all the battle, frankly. Yeah. To be honest with you, I mean, it, it, it's showing up more than the other person, showing up more than your competition, more mm -hmm. often with more intensity, being prepared and not giving up, and being relentless on that. I mean, that's the one piece that I don't think the students fully get yet because they haven't dipped into Because we have a rhythm. We've got a semester rhythm. We have a test rhythm. We've got, a, if, you're, if you're in athletic, if athletics, there's a, there's a season rhythm or a game rhythm that never stops in the real world. There's right. not those breaks. So it, it, it's a grind. You've got to push through and that level of, of, of urgency that's sustained is a, is a very different uh, orientation than, than the rhythm that we, we, all of us, me included, uh, grew up with because we always had these breaks. All right, so that's going to do it for episode six of From Sparks to Skyscrapers. I'd like to thank Dr. Ockers very much for taking the time out of his busy day uh, to join us here today. And thank you all for listening, watching, viewing, and subscribing. We will see you next time and next semester on From Sparks to Skyscrapers. My name is Joe Shapiro signing off. We'll see you next time.